Hello, my name is John Mad Dog Hall. I'm the board chair of the Linux Professional Institute, and I'm the president of Linux International. Our talk today is free and open source software and hardware for your career. For those of you who do not know me, I've been in the computer industry for 50 years. I've been a programmer, a systems administrator, marketing manager, technical marketing manager, CEO, consultant, educator, and a whole series of other jobs for a whole series of different companies. But the thing I'm most proud of is that I am pragmatic. I want to get a job done. And I happen to think that free and open source software and hardware is the best way of doing it. So what is open source? Open source is the access to and the right to use the source code of the binaries which you use in your job. But it's also the knowledge of how to turn that source code into binaries that run. So the access to the source code isn't quite enough. You need to have that knowledge also. Open source does not guarantee that source code or that knowledge. It's great for developers because they get a lot of code that they could turn into products or services relatively easily. But it's not so good for end users because the developers do not have to pass on the source code or their changes to the end users. What is free software? It's represented for the most part by the GNU public license. And it not only allows the developers to have access to the source code and this information, but it also forces that to be passed along to the end user. Specifically, it's the freedom to run the program that you get for any purpose whatsoever. It's the freedom to study how that program works and to change it so it meets your computing needs. It's the freedom to redistribute those copies to people that need them. And it's a freedom to distribute the modified code to other people as they need them. Now, these two types of licenses, open source and free software, are known as permissive and restrictive. The open source licenses are the permissive ones because it allows the developers to use the code without forcing them for other types of, of restrictions, such as passing on the source code and the information to the end users. The free software license is restrictive in the sense it forces the developers to pass on the source code, to pass on the restrictions, to pass on the changes to the end users. So it benefits both the developers and the end users. Now, Creative Commons is a license. It's kind of restrictive. It could also be permissive because of a little function of it called share alike, SA. Creative Commons is used for texts, used for music, for pictures, for movies, for videos. It allows people to distribute it, to copy it, to change it, uh, sometimes with attribution required. But whatever you get as a developer, you have to pass it on to the end user if it is share alike. Now, there is an organization called the Business Software Alliance. And basically, they are a, an alliance of companies like Microsoft, Oracle, Adobe, that come together to try and fight software piracy. Software piracy is where people take closed source proprietary software and use it, particularly on a desktop, but they do not pay for it. They pirate the software. And in Asia and Africa, about 96% of the software used on the desktop has been pirated, not paid for. Now, this, of course, hurts the companies that produce this software. They are, look, they are counting on that revenue to come in to help their company continue. And a lot of times when the software is not purchased, these companies either raise the price for the people that do pay for the software, or they may go out of business, they may go bankrupt. In Argentina, software piracy rate of desktop software is 
This represents about 308 million US dollars of software in the year 2017. If you take a look at the total amount of software, it's about $1 billion of software that's either pirated or paid for. And that 1 billion US dollars a year would be going out of Argentina to places like the United States or Europe or China or wherever the software comes from. In the United States, one of the richest countries in the world, we pirate 34% of our desktop software. So you see, it's not just the poorer countries that do this. It can also be relatively affluent co uh, countries that do this. Now, a lot of this software that is so-called pirated isn't necessarily pirated on purpose. Sometimes it's just bad accounting. As in the case of a company called Ball Music in California that made guitar strings. Their, their owner, a man named Sterling Ball, would say to his engineers, oh, I'm going to give you a faster computer. You take your old computer and give it to a secretary or you give it to a manager. And they would not take off the proprietary software that was on there that the engineers used. The secretaries and the managers wouldn't be using that software. It would just be sitting on a computer. Nonetheless, when the BSA came, they found that this software was on these other systems and was not licensed properly. And therefore, Ball Music had to pay 40,000 US dollars in penalties. But worse yet, to Sterling Ball, they had a reputation throughout Silicon Valley of a company that pirated software. And so Sterling Ball said, I want all of the proprietary software off of all of our systems. I don't want to use any proprietary software. I want to use only free software. And he did that, and he said it was the best move he ever made. This is also why a lot of companies like Microsoft and others are switching to web-based software, where you pay a subscription, because it's a lot, easy for, a lot easier for them to get their money, their subscription fees, from everybody that uses it. And therefore, hopefully, the prices will go down. But it means that people will have to pay for all the software they use, and that money will be money that will flow out of Argentina to other places. Piracy also hurts open source and free software. When I started coming to Latin America in 1994, I would say, you should be using free software. And the people would turn to me and they'd say, oh, mad dog, all of our software is free, meaning that they were pirating the proprietary software. This is, means that they would be less likely to use free software, less likely to be, to be used to how to change it, how to live with it, how to make it better, and less likely to take the money that they would get for proprietary software that they paid, less likely to pay that to local programmers to have a job. So what do programmers value overall? This was a study that was done. Uh, they asked programmers to make a long list of the different types of things that they valued. And then they took that long list, sorted it into order, and handed it to two groups of people. One group of people was called dev.to, and the other group of people was called Hacker News. And both of these organizations were, had developers in them. They said, take this list, and you pull out and prioritize the things of importance to you. As they came together, they found out that the two different groups working independently of each other came up with exactly the three top, same three top items. They valued most of all a work-life balance, to be able to balance their work life and the work that they did with their family life with their, with their passions, with their pleasures. And they wanted to be able to balance the two of them. That was the most important thing to both groups. The second most important thing was working with a high quality code base. In other words, if you work with a high quality code base, then the changes you make are easier to make. It's easier to work with. It's easier to improve. And they really liked that. The third thing they wanted was flexible work arrangements. Some of them wanted to come in early and leave early. Some of them wanted to come in late and leave late. 
Some of them wanted to work from home. Some of them wanted to work from the office. Some did wanted to work, do both. This is, they wanted it to be flexible. Now, after the top three, they started to diverge a little bit. One group wanted a good path up for junior de developers. And the other group said, well, we want to have impressive team members, people that we can all learn from each other. We want them to be good programmers. One group said, oh, we want people to be promoted from within. We don't want you to go to the outside and bring in people for promotions. We want you to grow the people that you have. Both groups wanted diversity in their teams. They wanted to have men and women. They wanted to have people of all races, people of all nationalities. They recognized the value of diversity in their groups. But in both of these lists, nowhere did they mention money because that was assumed to be true. It was assumed that if you were a good programmer and you worked hard and developed a good output, that you would be paid a reasonable salary and be able to live okay. So money was not in their top priorities. So with that, what types of things do open source developers like? Well, of course they liked all the things that all the other programmers liked, but they also liked visibility of their creativity. Now, programming isn't really a science. It's a little bit of a science and an art. It's so programmers are considered to be creative people. And they liked that creativity to be visible to the customers, to their peers, to other people. And open source allows that to happen. Now, you don't need to necessarily have this visibility on your competitive features in your product or your service. A lot of times, this uh, bit creativity is also in the less competitive features. In other words, does your operating system, is it stable? Is it fast? Is it, does it fit in small resources? These are things that everybody assumes are going to be there, but how you do them is a good part of being a creative engineer. They also like to talk to the customers and the users. Now, this isn't universal because there are some developers who are kind of shy and they don't really like talking a lot. There's some customers who you really don't want to talk to because they're kind of uh, brash. But for the most part, customers and developers and users all like discussing things, talking things over. And the developers really like this. Now, how can open source improve programmers' skills? Well, a lot of programmers like to look at other people's well-written code in order to see how to make their code better, how to be really good programmers. Knowing that their code can be seen by other coders and other people and users, they tend to push for better coding practices in amongst themselves and their peers. They also tend not to put in bad comments into their source code. In closed source code, a lot of times you'll find comments in there by programmers who don't like particular users or they don't like particular suppliers or they don't like particular groups of people. And knowing that the code is open source, they tend to keep those comments out. Another nice thing that improves programmers' skills is open testing. One of the things that made the Linux kernel relatively stable from the very beginning was the fact that they would release often and have people pull it down, put it on the system, test it, and feedback bug reports right away. And so this rapid turnover of the Linux kernel to thousands and tens of thousands of testers made for rapid development. So we're going to talk about two case studies about how free and open source software and hardware actually change the business of companies. And over the years, as I've talked about software and hardware, I began to realize that people don't really buy hardware and they don't really buy software. They actually buy a solution to a problem or a service. So even if that problem you're trying to solve is playing a game, it just so happens that computers are good for game playing, particularly over the internet. 
But if you could play that game with two tin cans and a string between them, you would. So if you think about buying a solution and supplying a solution, then some interesting things start happening. Take the case of IBM. About 30 years ago, IBM sold their laptop and small server division to a company called Lenovo. IBM realized that the profit margin on just the hardware was around three to 5% profit. And a company the size and complexity of IBM cannot survive on a three to 5% profit margin on their hardware. So they sold that division to Lenovo and they took the $2 billion they got for the sale and they bought a company called Price Waterhouse Cooper. Now Price Waterhouse Cooper was a service and solutions company. They used everybody's hardware and software to put it together into solutions for their customers. IBM joined Price Waterhouse Cooper with their own service and solutions department and doubled the size. And in that department, they had a 19% profit margin. And that was plenty enough profit margin to keep a company like IBM going. This is why when you go through the airports these days, where you used to see advertisements for IBM's hardware, like their 360, 370 mainframe series, or maybe their operating systems like MVS or VM, instead today, the only thing you see is IBM and business solutions. Here's another case, uh, this one from St. Petersburg, Russia. In Russia, there were five turbine test bed companies. They take turbines that generate electricity from water, steam, or air, and they test the efficiency of the design. They hook up sensors and they put the, the turbines in this turbine test bed, and then they measure the efficiency of the turbines. Four of these companies use proprietary software from a company, and the fifth one wrote their own software using Linux as an operating system, Tickle TK as a program to draw where the sensors are put and things like that, GNU plot to plot out the results, and the Apache web server to send the information to the engineers that needed it. They also used MySQL as a database to hold all this information. What they found out was that the four companies that used the proprietary software often took 10 months to get even the simplest change to the software so that the engineers could use it versus the company that used free software in St. Petersburg typically only needed three days to make a small change for the engineers. And therefore, the engineers who use the turbine test bed in St. Petersburg got much better service, much better information than the four companies that use the proprietary software. I want you to think about the billions of pesos that flow out of Argentina for closed source software every year. Even though you pirate 67% of your desktop software, you do not pirate a lot of your server software, which is much more expensive. Typically, companies have to pay for that. Uh, your government has to pay for that. Ed your universities have to pay for that. But this is billions and billions of pesos that flow out of Argentina every year. Um, the same thing can be true of generalized hardware, single board computers and things like that. Huge amounts of money flow out of Argentina to go to the uh, United States, to go to China and Europe. That could be kept inside of Argentina and creating jobs for Argentinians. Interesting, high paying jobs. Jobs like artificial intelligence or IoT, Internet of Things. And there is a university in Buenos Aires that makes little single board controllers that can be used for Internet of Things. You can put together solutions for this and export them to the Mercosur countries and throughout the world 
as part of your business. So with that, I will stop the talk and ask if there are any questions. Y estamos con nuestro querido Madog. Bien, acaba de terminar la, tar la charla de John Madog Hall, Free and Open uh, Source Software and Hardware for, uh, for Your Career. Así que bueno, ahora como siempre vamos a, vamos a tener aproximadamente unos 10 minutos con Madog. Lo que sí les pido, pongan todas sus preguntas en la sección de preguntas en el swap card y obviamente vamos a tener que switchar al inglés para hablar con, con nuestro querido Madog. Así que ya vamos a arrancar. John, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Great. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. Uh, once again, I apologize for the low quality of the video, but uh, I've been having some technical problems on my end, and uh, we'll just have to do the best we can. <laughs> we totally understand. Don't worry. Okay, so let me just dive right into the questions from the audience. So the first question is from Jorge. He is asking, what are your thoughts about Richard Stallman resignation from Free Software Foundation? Oh, the polemics. Um, Richard Stallman has a lot of different ideas about different things. And he was mentioning these things on his private blog. Uh, it was not, you know, even though it's, I mean, it's a blog that lots of people read, but it was not a blog of the Free Software Foundation. It was also something that he, there were some things he had written a long time ago where he had since changed his mind. Uh, Richard has a lot of ideas about different things. Uh, my personal feeling is that if I was him, I would have fought it a little bit more. I would have not turned around as fast, but I do not know the details of it. I know that Richard has made a huge amount of contributions to free software, and I still respect him for that. Great. Okay, uh, the next question is from Sebastian. He's asking, do you think free software is key to address the issue of digital privacy? <laughs> yes, I, I do. And it's not only digital privacy, but it's also key to security. Um, People these days use software from all sorts of different places, from wide varieties of different countries. Uh, my country in particular is kind of infamous for the National Security <laughs> Agency and some of the things that they have done to spy on other countries in the past. And I feel very strongly that a country, or at least a, a political group, if you want to call it that, should be able to make everything that they need in order for them to do computing. So they should be able to see what the software is inside of their system. They should be able to see if there are trap doors in it. And unfortunately, to do this really well, it takes a huge amount of effort, particularly with today's complex systems. Um, people might say, well, I use Linux and if necessary, I could build Linux from the very beginning, you know. However, how do you know about the compilers? Were the compilers written properly? Uh, do they generate the code you think they're generating? What about the BIOS? And what even about the microcode that's inside of the CPU? The microcode is, in effect, a tiny little program. And there could be malware inside of the microcode malware inside of device drivers that are binary only. So, it, and, and then even if you have all of that, you also have to be careful with where your data is going over the internet. Is it properly protected? Do you really know where it's going and where it's being stored? And this is a huge problem. It's a huge need. Um, so we have to keep working on it. Okay. Uh, next question, again from Sebastian. Um, how do you measure the impact of free software in the quality and innovation of software development? Well, I, that, that was actually part of my talk, I think, where yeah. you know people who write free software, they know that their software is going to be looked at, or at least the possibility is going to be seen. And consequently, they want to write software that they can be proud of, you know, that 
you know, the, the very nice piece, very easily seen and repaired software, software that when they leave the company, that somebody that follows them in the company is going to be able to fix the software, maintain the software. So that alone, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've run into issues with closed source software where we ask the company to open up their software and they say, we're embarrassed to open it up because the quality of the software was so bad. And we even have comments in there about uh, vendors of ours and customers of ours that we don't want those vendors and the customers to see those comments. So, <laughs> uh, free software and open source software tend to be f more free of that. <laughs> Good. Uh, next question from Hernan. Uh, he is asking, what do you think about ethical open source licenses? We discussed this a long time ago in the very first days of Linux. Uh, there were a large number of programmers who said, we don't want our software to be used for this. We don't want our software to be used for that. Uh, some people said, I don't want my software to be used by the military. And uh, Somebody else said, I don't want my software to be used by banks. And somebody said, well, I don't want my software to be used by insurance companies. And by the time you drew all these circles in a large Venn diagram, you found out that the software was not going to be able to be used by anybody. The only way you could, you could solve that problem would be if you only had one person writing the software and they would say, okay, my software that I write by myself is not going to be used by this particular group of people. Mm -hmm. But if you have thousands of people with thousands of different reasons why they didn't want different groups to be using it, then you don't have anybody using it. And if you start to work these into the licenses, you're going to find out that there's a whole set of lawyers who are going to be looking at these and saying, well, how does this limit our reuse of the software? And you're going to find out that people are not going to, re they're not going to do that because they can't count on the license allowing them to use it. So that's why the zeroth law was written. We yeah. said, we're going to allow anybody to use the software for any reason, because you do not legislate morality through technology. You create moral people by teaching them to be moral. You create ethical people by teaching them to be ethical. It's not the software that is there. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, you know, invented the zeroth law. I mean, for a long time, there was no zeroth law. There was only three laws. And then all of a sudden, the zeroth law had to come in. We had people leave the kernel project because they didn't like people making money off of the software that they were writing and contributing for free. But we knew that if we didn't allow people to use the software to make money, then Linux would move forward slowly like a glacier. Mm -hmm. Companies like IBM, Hewlett Packard, Amazon would not be able to use the software. And so, and, and you would have all these companies fighting you instead of embracing you and moving forward. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So, the, unfortunately, John, that is all the time that we have today. Uh, again, thank you so much for being part of, of this conference this year. Uh, you know, if, if they had any more questions, we're going to upload the, 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 the talk on YouTube later. And... Thank you again for joining us, John. I really like you guys. You do a great job down there in Buenos Aires. And I really like this army, so I'm glad I could participate. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. All right. So, muy bien. Ahí se fue John Maddock Hall uh, con su el Q&A de su charla free and open source uh, software and, and hardware for your career.